Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. If you enjoy this story, please give it a like and please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to hear more stories like this one or stories about the history of the North East. This, similar to the story of Mary Ann Cotton, is quite confusing at times. Some of the reported articles differ wildly and it's hard to know for sure if anyone actually knew what happened on the day of the murders. I will try to make the story as clear as possible. It's also slightly longer than my normal stories, but I hope it's worth listening to to find out all of the details of this tragic case. John Vickers Amos was hanged for the murder of three people, two of whom were police officers at the Sun Inn in Bedlington in 1913. This was commonly known as the Sun Inn Murders. There is a little twist to the story at the end. I will let you decide what you think. Was he guilty of all three murders? This is his story. John Amos was born in Scotland in about 1878. His parents were Janet and James and he had around eight brothers and sisters. His middle name of Vickers is his mother's maiden name. By 1881, the family had moved to Northumberland, where John's father was working as a coal miner. John married Isabella Brown in around 1899. Sources are confusing with a couple of different dates after 1899, but the 1901 census does have them living in Bedlington as man and wife with one child, and also during his trial, John himself did say that they were married in 1899. During their marriage, they had three children, all boys, and John worked as a coal miner. John had worked as a miner from the age of 12 years old until he stopped doing this kind of work in about October of 1912. He had not always worked in Bedlington. He had at times worked in the mines in America. It was said that he had been involved in two serious accidents in the American mines in 1912. His health, he claimed, had suffered greatly as a result of these accidents, with severe head pains, disrupted sleep, memory loss and also suffering severe nervousness, which the latter, I guess, we would describe as anxiety today. The accidents had been around a month apart and the first one had killed two men. John was said to have been quite badly burnt in this accident, because he had gone back into the mine three times to rescue other injured men. The second explosion had killed eight men and John had been caught in the blast, which resulted in more injuries to his head and he had also had to be carried out of the mine himself on this second occasion. Although there is no real evidence to support this, it could be suggested that this was the reason that John left America and his job as a coal miner and took up a job as the manager of the Sun Inn at Bedlington. The Sun Inn was owned by Mr James Wood Irons and he had employed John Amos as his manager in January 1913. John's wage would be around 30 shillings a week and he also had to pay a deposit of around £30 for the stock to Mr Irons when he first took on the job. Mr Irons would often visit the pub to see how well or bad the business was being run. In February, Mr Irons visited the inn and did a stock take with John. This stock take showed a shortage of just over £7. By April of 1913, this shortage had increased to £45, which was more than the bond that John had originally paid and Mr Irons then decided that he would have to dismiss John as his manager and replace him with someone else. It is said that Mr Irons wrote John a letter about this, saying that he would be visiting him soon, but it is also said that the letter did not discuss the idea of John being sacked and replaced, or that John did not understand it to mean this. On the 15th of April, Mr Irons arrived at the Sun Inn to speak to John and told him the situation. John is said to have asked Mr Irons if it was true that he was finished at the pub and Mr Irons said yes. And it is said that John then replied that he wanted his bond money back. Mr Irons this said that this would still depend on the stock situation. 
John was now fully aware that he would be losing his job and that he was also being accused of stealing a lot of money from the pub. Mr Irons had already decided to employ Mr Grice of Seg Hill as the new manager of the pub and he was due to arrive that same day, April the 15th. Mr and Mrs Grice arrived at around midday, accompanied by another couple, and Mr Irons went to meet them at the station, returning a short time later. Mrs Amos had apparently been seen downstairs with a rifle. John Amos had asked her where she was going with it, and she had claimed it was to be given to a neighbour for practice shooting. However, John had taken it off her and taken it back to the upstairs part of the pub. Some reports suggest that she was actually trying to remove the rifle from the pub, but it's impossible to say if this was the case or not. Did she feel that John would do something bad if she did not remove it? It was some short time after this that John Amos sent his son to the nearby shop for cartridges, which he bought and returned home and gave them to his father. It was some time after this that Mr Irons told Mr Grice to take possession of the stock as the pub was now his. John did not take kindly to this. It is said he told those listening that he would show them who was boss and that he had something upstairs that would shift them all. He then went upstairs. Mr Irons is then said to have gone to the police station to tell them of trouble brewing at the Sun Inn. Although nothing had happened at that point, he must have felt worried that something would. This is where the information about what happened from this point on is quite confusing. There are several different reports and articles about the murders, however they all seem to tell a slightly different version of events, so I will try to make them as clear as possible based on what information I have. It is not completely clear what happened to Mr Irons after he had been to the police station. One report does say that he came back to the inn with PC muscle and left again once he heard the first shots being fired and headed back to the police station. He is not mentioned during the shootings, so it seems that this could be true. The first officer to arrive at the inn was PC Muscle. Some reports say that he was there for a while, but others say that as soon as he went inside the inn, two shots were heard. It's not very clear what happened, as there doesn't appear to be any witnesses who saw what happened at this point. It is said that PC Muscle died instantly. The most unclear part of the story is that of Mrs Grice. The information is very confusing, but the majority of reports suggest that she was the second person to be shot by John, with some stories saying that she was trying to take cover in the cellar when she was shot in the head and fell down the steps to the cellar, but other stories say she was already in the cellar when John shot her. It is also said that Mrs Grice was still alive when she was found, but there was no hope for her survival and she died a very short time later of her gunshot wounds. The next officer to arrive was Sergeant Barton, who decided to go to the rear entrance. In the meantime, it was reported in one article that John had come out of the front entrance looking for the owner, Mr Irons, and was threatening people standing outside with the rifle, telling them to move along and to leave. He then retreated back inside, and it was there that he encountered Sergeant Barton. Other articles simply state that John was near to the rear entrance of the inn when Sergeant Barton arrived. Sergeant Barton tried to persuade him to put down the gun, but John did not do this and told him not to come any closer. Sergeant Barton apparently took one small step towards John and John then shot him. Sergeant Barton was shot in the chest and again it is said that he died instantly. I have found no clear evidence of where Mr Grice was during the shootings or indeed any evidence of where Mrs Amos was. I would imagine it was quite chaotic at the time and most of those inside the pub would have no doubt run outside once they heard the first shots and taken cover away from the inn. After shooting Sergeant Barton, John went outside to the back of the Sun Inn and some reports say that he was quite calm and actually stood and smoked a cigarette. It seems he was still looking for Mr Irons, as it would appear he was still the main target. It was also at the back of the pub that he met his wife. 
One article said he threatened his wife. However, another report given to a local paper by a female witness said that they simply stood outside talking and that John embraced his wife before running off into the fields at the back of the pub. The police and several locals set out in search of John Amos. It was a fairly big search party, as it is said that police officers were drafted in from a lot of the local areas. As he was on foot, they did not assume he would have got very far, and that he was possibly hiding somewhere. A culvert was spotted, and the police believed that he may be hiding inside it, as someone thought they had seen one, someone moving around. So a local farmer is said to have fired two shots inside the opening, and John Amos was quickly out of the culvert without the rifle, with blood pouring down his face due to a head wound. His injuries were not, however, said to be serious. He was then arrested for murder and taken to the police station. It had taken around three hours to find him, and the rifle was later found inside the culvert. The inquest heard from Dr J K Harworth that the victims had all died from gunshot wounds fired at fairly close range. PC Muscle, who was around 31 years old, had been shot twice in the neck and the chest. Sergeant Barton, who was around 40 years old, who had been shot once in the chest. Although I have seen one report that he was shot twice, but I think the single shot is most likely more accurate and Mrs Grice, who was around 33 years old, had been shot once in the head. It is worth noting that in some articles I have read during my research that the bodies of the three victims were kept in the Sun Inn overnight and that during a further visit to the pub the following day it was alleged that a police officer found a second rifle but I can't confirm this so it may well just be speculation or rumour and John Amos did not mention having a second gun during his trial. John Amos was formally charged before the local magistrates on April the 16th of willful murder of the three victims. He appeared in the dock with his head bandaged and supported on either side by police officers. He was described at the time as being of medium height, well built, clean shaven, but that he had a wild and unkempt look about him. John never spoke and he was remanded in custody. The funerals of the two police officers took place on the 18th of April 1913, just a couple of days after the tragedy. The shops in the town were all closed and it was said that the town of Bedlington had never seen such enormous crowds that had gathered to pay their respects to the two officers. Many officers from the local area were also in attendance. The procession to the cemetery was led by the hearse containing the body of Sergeant Barton with two mourning coaches following and then the hearse containing the body of PC Muscle and four mourning coaches following. The two police officers were buried side by side in Bedlington Cemetery. Only the mourners were allowed into the ground of the cemetery and the public was kept outside. A memorial was erected later to honour the officers at the site where they are buried. This was recently, in around 2003, repaired and rededicated. It would appear that John Amos was actually quite well thought of in the town of Bedlington. An appeal was launched to raise money for his defence at the trial, and one article said some £32 had been raised, and some members of the public individually given £5 and others given £3, which does show how well liked he was despite what he had done. The trial took place in July of 1913. John Amos pleaded not guilty to the charge of willfully murdering the three victims, PC Muscle, Sergeant Barton and Mrs Grice. The defence of John Amos was that he had not been in his right mind when he committed the crimes and that he now had no memory of them at all. He also stated that when Mr Irons had arrived at the inn, he had treated him badly, threatened to cut his throat and said he would not get a penny of his bond back and this had drove him wild and he could remember no more until he found himself in the police station. Mr Irons, when questioned on this matter, he denied this completely, saying he had never threatened Mr Amos at all and another witness said he had seen a gun that day 
for he had not seen anyone with a knife or heard any threats made to John Amos at all. John also said that Mr Irons had only given him one minute's notice to leave the pub. This again was denied by Mr Irons. One witness, a police officer, said he found 15 cartridges for the gun at the inn. He had apparently seen Mrs Amos take them from a pocket in her dress and place them into a drawer. It was not discussed in detail, so it was not explained why Mrs Amos would have had these unless John had given them to her when they met outside before he ran into the fields. On given further evidence, John still claimed to remember nothing after the argument with Mr Irons and that he had, in his words, driven him mad. He could not remember shooting anyone and he went on to say that those two police were good friends of mine and that he had never seen Mrs Grice prior to that day. He claimed that he had not said, I have something upstairs that will shift you all, but when asked, he did admit that he kept a gun upstairs. He said he did have a grudge against Mr Irons over the bond, but that he did not want to shoot him, and he also said that it had not been his intention to shoot anyone else, and said again that he could recall nothing of what happened during the shootings. He also denied that he had taken any money from the inn. It was later stated that when John was examined shortly after he was arrested, that apart from his head wound, he seemed perfectly clear about who he was and not confused at all, and seemingly no medical evidence could be found to prove that he really did not remember the dreadful events of that day. And it would seem that the jury were not in the slightest bit convinced that John had not known what he was doing, it took them only eight minutes to return a guilty of willful murder verdict on John Amos. When he asked if he had anything to say to this, John simply replied, I do not remember any of it. Those police were good friends of mine. The judge then sentenced John Vickers Amos to death by hanging and afterwards for his body to be buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. John took this quite calmly and is said to have even waved to some friends in court as he was taken from the dock. An appeal was quickly launched, which he denied, which was denied, and the execution date was set for the 22nd of July 1913. The day before the execution, John was visited by his wife and family. It was said to be a very solemn occasion. His wife had sobbed for the entire hour's visit and it is said that John did his best to comfort her but it had also left him grief-stricken as well. His wife and children all wept bitterly when they had to leave. Mrs Amos was accompanied on the visit by her sister. John never admitted to stealing the money from the Sun Inn. He always said he had not done this. He even said this to his wife on her last visit. This did lead to some rumours around the town that it had perhaps been someone else who had stolen the money and that John had actually known nothing about it. It was alleged that John had money which he had inherited so it would seem he did not need to steal from the pub. The day of the execution arrived. No details were given as to how John spent his last hours. It seems the prison were unkeen to give any information to the press at one minute to eight, John was pinioned, his hands were tied at the wrists, and taken to the gallows. The gallows were said to be only some 20 to 30 yards from his cell, and it is estimated that the whole process from removing John from his cell to the gallows and his execution took only around three minutes. Death was said to have been instantaneous. Afterwards, the under-sheriff said, John Amos met his fate very bravely. He also said John had been very well behaved during his time in prison. The body would have been left for one hour and then buried in the grounds of the prison. After John's death, a fund was started to raise money for his widow and children. The people of the town of Bedlington were very happy to help and it quickly reached a total of just over £83 which would be around £12,000 in today's money. The fund was not closed until the end of September, so the final total may have been a lot higher. 
Also in September, Mrs Amos left the UK to travel back to America with her three children. In one article, it was stated that she was accompanied by a local miner. This, it seems, went some way to help the rumours that she had been having an affair with this miner and also other rumours that she had secretly been married after her husband had died. But her passage to America was still booked in her original married name of Amos. Whether the miner left with her or whether he didn't is unclear, but it is possible that she did later remarry whilst living in America. She returned back to the UK several years later, but her children remained in the USA. Many people believed that it had been Mrs Amos who had stolen the money from the Sun Inn to be able to leave her husband and to fund the journey back to America with her alleged lover and her children. Some even think, based on the rumours of a second rifle, that it may even have been Mrs Amos who had killed Mrs Grice, but of course this has never ever been proven. Also, what reason would she have had to kill Mrs Grice, as John had already killed two other people, so he would have been hanged anyway, so there was simply no reason for her to do anything. But, for some reason, it was a theory which stuck for some locals for several years after the tragedy. What do you think about this idea? Why would Mrs Amos have wanted to kill Mrs Grice? Please let me know in the comments. A couple of other things worth a quick mention. It was alleged that bloodstains were still visible in the cellar in recent times, but I must admit to finding this hard to believe, as I would have thought they would have been cleaned and worn away over the years. And it was also alleged that there was still a bullet lodged in one of the internal doors in the Sun Inn in recent times. But I have never seen a photo and I have never been inside the pub, so I cannot say if this is true or not. I have mentioned the felon's plot before. When the bodies were removed from the old prison, John Amos was one of those who was reburied in All Saints Cemetery in 1925. I had previously been of the opinion that this would not have been discussed publicly, but I recently found a newspaper article that discussed the burials taking place, so it is possible that some people at the time did know where they were buried other than just the officials who performed the ceremony. I hope you have enjoyed this sad and tragic story. Please do let me know what you think in the comments below and please do give this video a like and please do subscribe to the channel if you would like to hear more stories like this one or more stories of the history of the Northeast. Thank you all very much for watching.